If you were to hide information, where would you hide it? Maybe the smallest place you could put it? Well, God put it in the nucleus of a cell, and he called it DNA. We call it DNA, for a lack of a better term, I guess. Somebody invented the term. There's also DNA in mitochondria. Now, this is a blown-up picture of mitochondria. There's where it fits into the cell. But it has its own DNA, so there's a mitochondrial DNA, and this compares really close to a computer program. The DNA in the, the nucleus uh, compared to the operating system. The mitochondrial DNA could compare to a subprogram within that operating system. Hmm. Do programs generate themselves? Not usually. Uh, a couple other pieces I'll just point out uh, in the cell that we're talking about. Uh, the ribosomes, the little tiny piece down here, those participate in protein synthesis. Uh, the lysosomes, uh, right in here, they contain enzymes that aid in digestion of nutrient molecules and other materials. So you probably heard before, this is like a little factory uh, going on. Uh, not something that would happen by accident. If Darwin had seen what's inside a cell, uh, I don't think, and many other people don't think, that he would have supported his own theory. Because he thought the cell was a building block, you put them in a paper bag, shuffle them up, pour them out a whole bunch of times, and you get different stuff. Cool idea, but it doesn't work. Next slide, please. Hey, this is the connection of the pieces in DNA. Like I said, I'm going to focus on AMP, ADP, and ATP. Uh, this is the A adenine part. Adenine always uh, corresponds with thymine. But it's a four-part system. When this is stripped in half and the code is red, it's red uh, one piece at a time and then converted into proteins. But with a four-part system, it's like a quaternary computer. Who's heard the term binary before? Binary means on off. That's how all of our computers are made. Nobody's ever invented a quaternary computer. So I've challenged myself uh, since I started this to make a quaternary computer, because it would model the human, the human body. It's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> so that's, that's one piece. Uh, when adenine is combined with a sugar, ribose, and then this P is phosphate, you have adenosine monophosphate, because there's only one phosphate. The sugar is part of the backbone of DNA, this double helix. And then the P combines the two pieces of information. Now, that's not a D over there. That's an upside-down P. Whoever made this diagram uh, flipped it upside down. He probably pointed that out. Oh, you got the D wrong. What's a D? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a P. Uh, these double bonds and triple bonds are between the uh, various components. Uh, a and, uh, what's the other one? G. Yeah, a and G are a little bit bigger because they have a, a double uh, circle, a double oval, what we call that. And the other ones have a single one. Let's go to the next slide. So here's a, my friend, AMP, ADP, and ATP. This is a picture of ATP. The yellows are the phosphates. That's what makes the triphosphate. Uh, this is the ribose part right in here, and this is the adenine. You can see the double circle of adenine. So there's one of these uh, molecules for each one of the nucleotides, uh, with the exception it's a monophosphate. So the building blocks of DNA have the monophosphate, and then the diphosphate and the triphosphate become the energy particles of the whole system. Uh, when it's a diphosphate, it's depleted energy. When it's a triphosphate, it's a lot of energy. And God designed it very efficiently. So next slide, please. This slide is not as complex as it looks. It's worse. <laughs> I'll walk you through a few of the pieces, uh, but you can go to any biology book and break out these parts. This is the glycolysis part. This is the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. And then this is the electron transport chain. So each one of those has their own huge amount of detail. 
uh, you'll recognize at the top, and that's the interesting thing about biology, you start recognizing terms uh, for, for normal things that you see uh, through daily life. Proteins, everybody know what a protein is? Unless you're a vegetarian, you don't like proteins. Uh, maybe even less beans, but uh, you want to eat, eat a hamburger, that's a protein. Uh, carbohydrates, we eat those. Fats and lipids, we eat those. So this is all stuff that we eat, and metabolism is how that is converted into energy. Now the interesting thing about this system, it works in reverse. It's a reversible system. Not only can it use these three things, but it puts it back. You can make proteins, you can make carbohydrates, and you can make fats. How many of you don't like the idea that metabolism makes fat? <laughs> it's the thing we're trying to get rid of. Uh, but if, if we understood this cycle better, we could actually put your system into reverse or in forward instead of reverse and get rid of those fats a lot easier than all the diet methods. Uh, so one thing I'm going to point out, this is glucose 6 and pyruvic acid 3. It doesn't say 3 on there. So this goes from a glucose 6 to a pyruvic acid 3. That means the three atoms of carbon. And I'm going to do a little bit of math up here. Uh, there's a couple of things that are generated by this process uh, and feed into the electron transport chain. One of them is NADH. Anybody guess what the A stands for? Adenine. Hmm, it pops up again. There are two of those, two of those generated in the glycolysis process, and there are four of those generated in the Krebs cycle. But since the Krebs cycle is fed by the pyruvic acid, the Krebs cycle goes through twice. For every NADH, there are three ATPs generated in the electron transport. So we have six ATPs from glycolysis, plus there are four ATPs generated by the cycle itself, but it uses up two ATPs during the cycle, so we end up with eight ATPs on the Krebs cycle. We also have another uh, compound FADH2. Anybody know what the A stands for? Adenine keeps coming up. Uh, there are one of those generated for each, uh, each cycle through the Krebs, uh, but there are only two ATPs for each one of those. Uh, we get 3, 3 minus 4 is 12 ATPs for a total of 14 ATPs, but we go through the cycle twice, so we end up with 28 ATPs, and there's one ATP from the cycle itself, but since it goes through twice, you've got two more, which gives you a total of 30 ATPs for the Krebs cycle. Add that with the glycolysis cycle, you've got 38 ATPs. And one more, one place I read that says they lose two ATPs because of the transfer to the mitochondria. Everybody got that? <laughs> Again, I've simplified it. God made it much more complex. He's not telling us the whole secret. So for every two ATPs that put into this system, we get 36 out. Now, is that incredible or what? Next slide, please. So these are four questions that the Biologic Institute are asking in their research. Uh, the first one, what would it take for a working genetic code to originate? Basic life, what's the, the simplest form of life? Can we make life? What would it take? Second question, what would be the simplest metab metabolic system? Uh, I've gone through the metabolic system. Uh, does that sound simple? No. Not really. For a free living organism. Now this next one, a force transducing molecular machine. Now it sounds like a complicated word, but I've got a picture here of the flagellum and the little motor. That's a, f that transduces the, the force to motion. 
That's all that is. And this last one, the protein folds, uh, that's this picture up here. The three-dimensional aspect of protein has an incredible effect on what it does. So Biologic Institute is looking at those protein folds and saying, what if we go from this protein fold to that protein fold? What would it take? What's the probability of going from uh, an amoeba to something else or a fish to a bird or uh, some, some, uh, some difficulty like that? So because of these kind of questions that are being raised, next slide this is my last slide. Uh, they're proposing that it can't happen in this universe, so maybe it could happen in multi-universes. This was actually in the Scientific American this year, January 2010, as a viable theory. They call it viable. But you'll notice maybe some of the TV shows coming out now. There are at least three of them I know of that are talking about multiverse. So not only are the scientists talking about it, but, well, this is a difficult concept. We're going to have to convince the general public. We'll do that through TV, maybe movies too. So I'll revisit my opening question. Is God proprietary or open source? Think so? I would say it's proprietary. I'll give you my answer. You can ask me more if you want on the, when I'm up on the general discussion. Uh, he gave us an operating system. And like Windows 7, you can use that operating system, but you don't know the original code. That's the mystery of life. If we could know the original code, we could manipulate it, and we could use it for our own purposes. A lot of people would like to know that information. So God's not revealing that information. A lot of people would like to know that. That's right. <laughs> it's really hard to reverse proprietary code. A lot of people have tried to do that, especially a code as complex as the biological system. Thank you.